All right, so to recap what happened last time, uh, two episodes ago we entered this town, and we found out that apparently uh, some noble's daughter has gone missing and so on. We're like, ah, fine, let's go check it out. Nice little side quest to level up our party members, potentially. Then we came up here, and we immediately got sidetracked by the fact that someone was apparently trying to escape town, and someone was hunting them, and we tried to help them escape. And so, we've actually made zero progress at finding the daughter, which we're going to now proceed to do. I was proceeding under the logic that, hey, maybe, just maybe, this little church-type area might be prone to having some kind of information. I figure if everyone in town is, is intentionally lying, or <clears throat> that's what the noble thinks anyway. The noble, the nobleman thinks that people are uh, that people in town know all about the daughter, and they're just intentionally hiding the information from him. So I'm wondering if I come into a church, maybe they'll be more honest here. We'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, how's it going? Selby and Harbinger Bodmer. Out with you! I already told you what. I'm sorry. I thought you were one of those ruffians. Racist. Poor fellow. That looks painful. Kana frowns, his brows knitting. It's a sorry deed, striking a priest. How may I help you? What happened to you? I never saw their faces. Strange hooded men asking about those ruins. Cleoban Relog. Most of the brigands who come through here asking about the ruins are looking for a few ancient trinkets. But these people knew the name, and they were in a hurry. Oh, sounds like we're about to start another side quest with some sort of people hunting ruins that were, are probably dangerous if they're attacking priests. They wanted to know where Cleoban Relog was. I tried to keep it from them, but I couldn't hold out forever. I don't know what they were up to, but it can't be good. Is there something else I can help you with? Can you tell me where to find the ruins? The Glanfarthen tribe that guards the ruins will kill anyone who trespasses there. And they'll retaliate against us too, if history is any indication. We've had too many fortune seekers stir up trouble of late. If I'm to tell you, I'll need to know your reason for wanting to go. Here I was. He, f he, hold he folds his arms and stares at you with one eye and a scowl. If this is where I say, go in the ruins and I'll, ki or, and I'll kill you, and that's when you say, here I was, I'm a watcher, and you're, no, and you're no match for all of us, and we've got good reason for this, and then I give up trying to argue with you and, and leave you to dig your own trespasser's grave. And I'm only being half metaphoric. We some we sometimes make dear woodens dig with your own grave before we kill you. When the kids hear about it, it's a fabulous deterrent. So apparently, Hiravai does not want us to enter the ruins. Which I'm not trying to. I'm not specifically trying to go into the ruins. It's just if someone's going after the ruins, I want to stop them. Let's see, I can say that I'm on business for the Duke. I don't want to lie right now. Let's see, I'm not gonna beat them, no. I'm just saying that something bad's happening and I wanna try to stop it. If that's the case, then we may already have trouble headed our way. I'll have to take you at your word. You'll find Cleoban Relog here. Whatever trouble you find there, please end it quietly and try to stay out of the ruins. Have you seen Lord Heron's daughter? I'm afraid not. Lord Heron's men already asked me, and that was the first I'd seen of any of his party. He holds a hand to his heart. Wherever she is, in this life or another, I hope he takes comfort that her soul is with Barath. Is this the temple of Barath? What can you tell me about Barath? Barath is the most universal of all the gods. It oversees portals and cycles of all kinds, even life and death itself. Under Barath, an ending is merely a passage to another beginning. Barath has many represent representations across time and other cultures. Around the Deerwood, you'll commonly see it depicted as the Pallid Knight or the Usher. The Glanfathans, however, know it as Bunin, e Kaknu, 
and Iknu i Bunin. Tell me about this pallid knight. She's one of the youngest manifestations of Barath, but a familiar one nonetheless. Stories depict her as a gaunt knight in a black armor with black eyes, black hair, and milk pale skin. She determ she demands is an impossible toll from travelers. <laughs> that pronunciation. <laughs> She demands an impossible toll from travelers who have tarried too long on her lord's road. Some challenge her only to slay themselves in the process. Who is the usher? Kith have written stories, songs, and poems about the usher for centuries. Sometimes he's folk, sometimes dwarf, and sometimes merely a walking skeleton. He never speaks. But he guides the way to death and the next life. He also creates the circumstances for the wayward to stumble into their own graves. I've never heard of Bunin i Aknu and Iknu i Burden. It means life in death and death in life, respectively. You see them as two skeletal figures, one male and one female. How explorers have found them carved opposite one another in doorways, but I know of no particular legends that speak of them. Thanks for the information. More confusing things to know about all these different religions. All right, let's, let's might as well hear about Deerwood, uh, Deerford. He might have something new to say. Folk tend to take heap to themselves here, as they do in most towns this deep in the Deerwood. They're suspicious of travelers, but with all the brigands and refugees moving through the area, who can blame them? Farewell. That's a reasonable assessment. They're hesitant and suspicious of travelers. That would help explain why they won't communicate, uh, cooperate with the with uh, the king. I know the, the the lord or whatever that's around here. Let's see. Oh, yep. That looks, that, that's the continuation of the main quest. The quest that uh, yep. Okay. We, one of the three quests we got from the weird vision, one, it involved coming here to Death's Gate. So I'm going to avoid this particular situation for now, just because it's probably going to be high level, because we've done very little side questing, and the last main story mission gave me a lot of trouble. So I'm going to focus on finding the daughter for now. Beodma showed me where to find Kleob and Riglag, but he warned me to steer clear of the Glenfathen tribes guarding the ruin. We'll get into that later. Who's this over here? Kelby? Is that a another witness, I suppose? Flames dance amid scattered offerings. Keys, coins, and the tiny skulls of birds and mice are mired in the melted and hardened wax. Talk to Boadmar. No one trusts me with anything more than lighting candles. Well, you have a boring existence. I know, we'll break this pot. I'll loot this church. No, let's not. Let's not, let's not loot the church. We don't need... Yeah. We, our reputation doesn't need that particular hit, I don't think. Alright, so... We have to go back to exploring town. What's this grieving mother symbol over here? Let's head in that direction. I'll track my party and see if they run by anything I want to investigate on the way, but... Big, obvious icon on the map seems like it's worth checking out. Is that a named person? That's just some guard. The fact that he doesn't even have a name makes me think that he probably doesn't have a lot to say. Generic villagers. I'm looking for named NPCs because they might be handy for uh, figuring out what may be going on around here. There's the grieving mother. Does she have a bow? She looks like she has a sword or a knife and a crossbow attached to her. She has an interesting method of grieving. Yeah. Alright, let's go talk to her. This middle-aged peasant woman is dressed in a brown leather cloth draped down to her knees. Her hands are working at separating stringy, colorless vegetables in a pile before her, stripping the heads off the long, fiber stems with a paring knife. Interestingly, she has a pretty detailed little portrait on the side of the screen, so that indicates she's actually going to be relatively important. She discards the stems one by one, placing the heads of the vegetables into a small, cradle-like basket in front of her. She doesn't greet you as you approach. You're not sure she even knows you're there. Excuse me? The woman doesn't respond. 
She keeps stripping the heads from the vegetables with a steady rhythm. She may be deaf. There's no indication she heard you. Let's just take a look at her. At first glance, she seems nothing more than a middle-aged woman. Unremarkable. Maybe less stern than most, who seem more focused on the weaving in her lap than her surroundings. Yet, who... You suddenly notice she's not stripping the vegetables before her any longer. She's weaving. The vegetable pots are now missing. She pays you no mind. Her brown locks torn and snagged from lack of washing. Like many of the town folk you've seen, there is a strange blur to her. Even the motions... Oh. I completely misread that. Her brown locks torn and snagged from lack of washing. Like many of the town folk you've seen. There is a strange blur to her. Even the motions of her hands seem to be playing with the threads that lack color. In a shape that lacks interest. So she's she's probably magic oriented in some way. Or ghostly? Spirit like? It may be she is half minded or deaf. Well, I guess I assume half minded is like mentally handicapped. But something feels wrong. As you approach, her knitting takes an odd cadence, and you have a terrible suspicion that something lurks beneath what your eyes are showing you. Focus on the woman. Maybe we can use our ability. Her brown hair is long, almost impossibly to the length of her hands. As you follow the streams of her locks downwards, the hairs become long and black, splitting off into threads of black and silver and wrapping around her hands. She is forming a soul cradle with her threads, braiding a net in front of you, each finger long and sharp like a series of knitted needles, almost hypnotic. The silver and black strands of her hair weave together, with silver, with silver predominating as a highlight the black shadowing it. And suddenly, you are calm. You are on a plateau almost the height of a tower, several stories high. The plateau is like a table lying beneath the clear sky. The beneath, And beneath the plateau, surrounding it in all directions, a forest, hazy with mist. Although whether it is an actual mist, or a distance, or a recollection, resting in the curve of a natural arc above you is a great copper bell, half again the size of a man, hanging at attention as if looking down on you and the event unfolding before you. The plateau has soaked in the sun, and the rock beneath you is rough and warm. The sky forms a cradle around you. You feel different, not disembodied, but you feel your body. Your physical contours have changed along with the surroundings. And you hear a soft series of chimes, like wind chimes. At the sound, the scene gains color and texture as if the sound is beckoning you gently forth, filling your senses and, and thoughts. This mist, like mist roiling softly into a sealed chamber, and focus on the chimes. The chime coaxes you deeper into the memory and you've, you're certain it is a memory, a warm one. You are on the stone of the plateau. Your knees are the warm texture of the ground. Silver, white, shimmering like Adra. The plateau is formed of it, glistening in the sun. You can feel the heat on your skin, your wrists, and your hands. Your hands are in motion, weaving, not thread, but gathering, Tenderly moving along the first movements of Barath's wheel, your hands are wet. Your hands are upon the flesh of a newborn child, and you can feel the crowning of a tiny head turning in your grip, its head slick wet from the womb. The hands you are wearing, inhabiting, have done this many times, and they are practiced and confident. You can feel distant pains in your own head as the head emerges. A stream of fluid from the womb helping the newborn slide forth, and a woman's laboring breath crying out. Focus on the child, the movement of your hands. As your hands move, you hear the sounds of chimes, clear, cutting through the haze of the memory. You cannot see what they are coming from, but they are close, and they are meant as a comfort. Of that you are certain. 
draw the child forth. And coaxed by your hands, every movement causing the chimes to sound again, almost eagerly, the child comes forth, and as it does, your hands are in motion, weaving, weaving, moving along the length of a soft, wet rope, no, an umbilical cord from the legs of the naked woman before you. You are holding a small child, still wet from the womb, before you. The child cries out, its cry full of life, full of soul, the ringing of chimes echoing in its thoughts, filling it with its welcome. The soul is blurred at the edges, as if you are viewing a soul from within a soul, but it is there, it is alive. The woman before you is weeping, and at her first cry, her hands reach out for it. Surrender the child. You surrender the child to her, something you have done many times before. As your hands move, the, ch the chimes echo the movement, and you realize the chimes are hanging from cords on your wrists, and where once they echoed in the memory, they are now echoing in the child's mind as well. The chimes are intended to welcome the child, to be its first gentle greeting into the world, a soothing sound guided by the tender movements of the wrists. You are helping to weave its thoughts, its perceptions, and the experience. The experience. The woman laughs with a ragged joy, laughing from a parched throat. Her emotions seem soothed, but the physical demands of labor have left her exhausted. But the child is here. The child is safe, and all atop the plateau is peaceful, calm, distant, flattening out as the memory persists. Slowly pull back. Retreat from the memory. With effort, the scene bleeds of color and your mind becomes your own again. There is no pull, no anchor, yet the sound of the chimes remain. As they exist in the memory, they sound here as well. They are hanging from the woven braids of the wrists of the woman before you. Even as your head is spinning from the touch of her mind, the sound of the, her, of the chimes on her wrists are sharp and clear, as if coaxing you back to the real world. So did we just inhabit the memory of a character who was a midwife? Or was she... Uh, does she have psychic powers of her own? Because it... We talked about feeling pain on our head as the child was born, which almost implies that we're somehow in the head of the child, like in, in, like in their mind? The woman still sits before you, but she is nothing like what you first saw. She's wearing black shredded garments that drape over her form like streamers. Her hair is streaks of black and run through with silver. Her age is almost impossible to tell. She simply feels old, like a crumbled watchtower. As she lifts her head to face you, you see that her hair is draped across the front of her face like a veil. Her description is actually surprisingly similar to the religious, like the uh, explanation given to us by the uh, people in the church of a character. What you first saw of her was a mental glamour of some sort, unconscious, and you realize that you see that what you see is not what the world sees, and you are perhaps the first to see her true self. Still, you don't sense any threat in the realization. If anything, you feel a sense of relief from the figure. You can hear her thoughts, and she is glad to at last be seen. Who are you? I am seen, but the eyes of others do not remember. You were the first to see me as I am, the call stripped aside. There is a light touch on your mind, a caress, and her left hand mirrors the motion of the torch, of the touch, reaching up to the air, be reaching up to the air between you. You hear the chime on her wrist sound softly. Her hand moves as if par uh, pantomiming, resting on your cheek at a distance and she speaks softly and slowly. Your memories, the cadence of wheels on a caravan track, fever, questions by running water, violence in a night's campfire, arrows in the dark, and fleeing, falling rock and cracking stone, and a storm, the storm. 
She stops, her hand frozen in the air. The storm that brushed you, did it scream? Did its screaming wake you from your mind's cradle? The question seems to be for both of you. Your memory of it is p painful. Its cry is difficult to ignore. It is like a child, many children crying out. I encountered a Biowak, yes, and it did something to me. Her hand withdraws shyly, the chime sounding softly once again. The woman stands uncertainly as if she has been sitting for some time or is too weak to bear her own weight. You notice her cheekbones are tight, her face gaunt. Yet while her stance is weak, she seems determined to stand before you. You are able to see me. It is almost a question. You suddenly realize she doesn't seem to know what you saw when you looked at her. The image on the plateau... Yet the image was so clear, so sharp, you're surprised she didn't feel you there. To see me is a rare gift. A watcher's gift. If I was a cipher, I could leave a specific comment here. Why, why would a cipher have... Oh, yeah. Ciphers like the, are like soul warriors, right? So like they have special knowledge. Is she a cipher? Let's see. I can say I've never been able to do that with a living person. How was I able to enter your dream? Was I helping a woman given birth? Or you said you heard a storm of my thoughts. How was I able to enter your dream? So many questions. Thoughts whirling like storm winds. That storm still roars through you. Deep beneath your thoughts. Yet muted and secret. Like an underground river. I cannot tell if it is carving new channels. Or eroding what keeps your true strength buried. The fact that you could hear it at all. Survive it is something few have ever done. Your power will grow stronger with each soul you touch, as it allowed you to reach out to mine. There is a silence, and although it seems to last for but a heartbeat, in your thoughts it stretches out between the two of you like a pull between your minds. You blink, take a breath, and then you realize she wants to ask you a question. You can't form the words, as if assembling it them is painful, or there is simply not enough pieces. I can assemble the thought and say, do you wish to travel me? I can say, you should come with me, you can't stay here, or I must take my leave. Let's ask if she wants to come with us. You feel a wave of fear, gusted with the strength of relief. Although oddly, her expression does not change. Then fear dissipates, and you feel strength and serenity, uncertainty, as if the plateau from her memory lies beneath you, and a calm sky looks down upon you. And the party grows. I think I'm going to swap her. There we go. Let's not deal with my ranger anymore, because she seems less than effective in many ways. A cipher. This is going to be interesting. So we have a cipher, a druid, a chanter. If I want it... If I want to remove somebody and replace them with my, uh, with my wizard, this is my chance. Especially since he's a little lower level. But I don't know if that's the best approach. Maybe I'll bring the wizard instead of the druid. There we go. I do want to have the wizard around, not just a level, but because he can, he can be a, a useful offensive power. Also, I want to have more quirks from his weird split personality, because I kind of have been missing him lately. They definitely have been showering me with, with characters very quickly. Alright, we have a new quest then. Dream and memory. I met a strange woman. Oh, we have a new thing. You found a new grimoire. Grimoires often contain spells that your wizards may or may not know. For a small cost, you I already know all this. <sighs> Accidental yawn. Sorry. I met a strange woman whom I know only as the grieving mother. She's a powerful cipher who shrouds herself from plain view. Yet, even though our minds experience a powerful communion, I know little about her or where she came from. If we want to learn about her past, uh... When I first encountered the Grieving Mother on the road, I experienced a dream. Or was it a memory? Of childbirth? Perhaps the Grieving Mother herself can explain what I saw. Can I talk to her one-on-one? -on -one? 
it's hard to imagine that I, the context in which I like I recruit her to my party, but then I just leave. Uh, then I just send her off to a uh, town instead. So she has thirty focus. So she has another new resource to to manage now. That's not what I thought she would look like. Just wearing kind of heavy looking armor. Fine padded armor, any sort of special effect. Plus two DRs, that's about it, okay. Let's look into her character abilities, perhaps. So she has first and second level cypher spells. Oh, they consume focus, interesting. So she actually has a resource that I assume replenishes in some way, which is interesting because uh, everyone else has limited spell casts. So she has Ice Strike, uh, requires four, 10 focus, attacks the enemy's fortitude, shocks enemies' visual receptors, da uh, dazing and blinding them, as well as blinding nearby targets. Mind Wave attacks their will. Target becomes the object of a concussive blast of psychic energy, suffering raw damage from the trauma. Uh, uh, characters in the conical area behind the target, flailing, failing a fortitude check, are knocked prone from the blast. In combat, I can do Whisper of Treason. Attacks Will for 10 focus. Imparts a bedeviling secret to the enemy that causes its allegiance, its allegiance to bend, charming them for the duration. Oh, awesome. So there's an ability that lets me make an enemy an ally for a little while. Mind Blades. Attacks their deflection. Uh, 15 focus. Co-ops the target's essence, generating a slashing blade of force that atta attacks them before leaping to up to five additional targets, so it's like a chain lightning type ability. Phantom Foes attacks Will, invades the minds of targets in the area of effect, causing them to believe they are surrounded by phantom foes, leaving them flanked for the duration. So you use this on somebody, uh, and everyone in that area is constantly flanked, so they're easy to do extra damage to and hit easier. Recall Agony. Causes, attacks their will, causes the target to, rele to relive the psychic trauma of an injury moments after receiving it, experiencing the damage all over again. So 30% of all damage is reapplied for the next 13 seconds. So it's like getting 30% bonus damage on that target, that's actually pretty damn effective. My question though is how does this character work? So they have focus... My I understand spending focus, but how do I get more focus is the question. Maybe it just replenishes over time? We'll see how it goes. This will be an interesting situation. Definitely need to redo my formation. Just to make sure... Let's put our, uh... Where's my priest character? You're supposed to be... Yeah, that, that, cause the moment you change your party composition at all, it gets completely fucked. Let's get our spellcasters out back. There we go. That's probably a better situation. She seems she might have some melee capabilities, so I'll put her near the front. Uh, definitely your two straight up range characters go in the back. Click on it to toggle it. Alright. So where are we gonna go next? We have a new party member, but we don't have... The Curary. That's probably useful. Should I be looking into resting, perhaps? I think I might rest until morning at this point. Just because our party's a bit injured from that fight we had earlier. And it's dark. I don't want it to be dark anymore. Let's make it not dark. <laughs> Looks like Aleth has something to say to us. Listen. There's something I should probably tell you. That's an understatement. He clasps his hands together, slowly massaging a knuckle with his thumb. I meant no harm. I thought I could keep it to myself that when we resolved the matter of your soul, we would also address my problem. I also have an awakened soul, but unlike yours, mine is a presence that shares my senses and my skin, making herself manifest at the most unwelcome times. He closes his eyes and grits his teeth. His, his lips quiver and twitch when the vestiges of some eternal debate. Several seconds later, he opens his eyes again. They're watery and bloodshot. I'm sorry. I've tried to learn to control Isilmir. I've gotten stronger, but so has she. Tell me about Isilmir. Artless, uncouth, a creature of rash impulses and feeble faculties. 
She wags her impertinent tongue when she should listen. Aye, this one's fit to boil. Hard to get this gaff over anything tisn't to do with books and spill speak. He grimaces, running his hand through his hair. I have none of her memories. Barath spared me that much. But her coarse manners and intolerable heel speak suggest a provincial of some very, very long time ago. She tends to surface a hair's breadth from conflict when the fuse was has burned down and the teeth are on edge. And when she shows up, she doesn't stop to gauge the situation. She just acts. She seems reckless. That's it exactly. You recall the way she gutted those villagers in the Gilded Vale? She doesn't think. She doesn't back down. And trying to suppress her... Trying to suppress that has been my problem for years. Why didn't she say something sooner? I learned to keep her a secret a very long time ago. Those with awakened souls are shunned, mistrusted. And after your experience with Meowald, I'm certain you can see why. You need to be careful. Is this going to be a problem? Merely an annoyance. Although... He lowers his voice and clasps his hands behind his back. Multiple twitches and spasms along his arms betray his fidgeting. Defiance Bay is said to have an entire institution dedicated to the study and cure of soul-related ailments. Since our journeys have already brought us to the city, perhaps we could speak with someone there. I was about to say that would have been a good thing to bring up when we were there, but I don't think he was in my party when I went there, actually. Uh, if it's helpful to you, we'll go. Thank you. This has been a great burden. Anything else to talk about? How may be of service? Uh, how long were you in the Gilded Vale? Not much longer than you. As you, saw, as you saw, it was hardly the haven that it had been advertised. I'd like to more, know more about Isomir. Such as? When did she awaken? My father was a strict man. He expressed the best from his own... He expected the best from his only child, and that didn't tolerate failure. And he didn't tolerate failure. Holy shit, I'm terrible at reading today. <laughs> his face becomes drawn. At times, he would seem rather adamant, particularly when he'd been drinking. Isomir manifested in one such occasion. To be honest, I don't remember the specifics, only that he was more careful with me after that. You said you learned to hide her long ago. My mother instructed me to keep her a secret after she first emerged. She feared that knowledge of my awakening would render me an outcast. Even though Isomir prov 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 uh, proved useful against my father, I trusted my mother's advice, and I've since come to see the wisdom behind it. Merwald is an extreme example, but one that I can relate to more and more each year. Can I talk directly to her? He gives you a taut frown. Her usurpations are uncomfortable enough. I'm not eager to invite her into my consciousness more than necessary. Let's discuss something else. Any thoughts on what we should do next? His mouth twitches, and he frowns. You're looking for the leaden key now, yes? If I were you, I'd want to know what they're after. His eyes narrow. I expect the leads from the Acolyte should prove more useful. Uh, not much to get from there. Hey, you should do that thing that we heard about a second ago. Anyway, let's, hmm? let's try to recover the party a little bit, because we're... Kana in particular is already halfway out of endurance. And we can fix this for relatively cheap, considering how much money we have right now. Uh, tell me about Lord, Her Lord Heron's daughter. He frowns and shrugs. His, lordship's, his lordship says he went missing the other day. He wipes a tankard from his ragged towel, twisting it with a shift. Jerking motions. Swift jerking motions. I don't know any more than that. However, these lordling bastards handle their affairs. Ain't no business of mine. I could pay him. Or, oh, I could use perception. You look agitated. Something about this doesn't sit right with you, does it? He slams the clean tankard down on the bar. Damn right it don't. The lord saunters in here like he's cut from cleaner cloth than the rest of us, and yet... He shakes his head. Look, I don't want no trouble from him or anyone else. I'm just trying to wait. 
I'm just waiting for him to tire of my ale so that, and leave so things will get back to normal around here. Okay. I need to be benevol bene I need to be benevolent or honest to get two of these things, which apparently I'm not, <laughs> and I need to have high resolve for the other option. <laughs> Never mind, I want to talk about something else. Uh, let's see what rooms you have. Make sure you close your window if you're on the side facing Tyrgul's shop. Tyrgul's shop? Might have to look into that later. Uh... Let's splurge a little bit, get some might and constitution. I have money right now. So eight hours have passed, and we have a quest called Two-Sided. Oh, that's the uh, split personality thing. Let's see here. How big is this area? Very small. Probably not a lot to get around here, so let's just go ahead and just get back outside. I'm curious about that hall he was talking about a second ago. Well, whatever happens, at least we're out of that mud hole, Gilded Vale. Hmm? I grew up in Gilded Vale. Quaint. That's what I meant to call it. No, nope. you had it right. Yeah? We're getting along great. So they said, close your window if you're on- if you're facing Triggle's place. Let's go meet Triggle, I'm curious, because he's got a weird broken building. What's going on around here? That's... fragrant. That's... fragrant. Okay, so it smells bad around here. What's this thing do? It's a curie. Let's, we'll head on inside. Maybe we'll learn something. I can't find it anywhere. I never. We'll talk about this later. Get back to the dyes. I'll take cure. I'll take care of our customer. Oh, curery, as in like you cure things. Eh? Is that why there's dyes everywhere? Interesting. All right. Yeah. Good day, stranger. What can you tell me about Elise Herond? Only that her father has been banging down doors and stirring up trouble looking for her. I've never met her myself. What do you have for sale? Oh my god, that's some... Alright, exceptional dagger? What's its effect? Wow, so it has plus 5 accuracy and then plus 8 accuracy t and times 1.3 damage. Making it an ex... <laughs> yeah! That would qualify as an exceptional dagger, alright. Let's see. So you sell high-level equipment, apparently. Regeneration? Plus one endurance regeneration, it looks like. Trollhead belt? Girdle of mortal protection? Decreases crit damage taken by... Oh, wow. Gets rid of about three-fifths, uh, three-fourths of, uh, crit damage. So pre those, those are actually less expensive, too. Ah... Uh, let's see... Can I look at what Eddar's currently wearing? I can't. Uh... Inventory? There we go. So Eddar's currently using... Oh right, he has a second chance equipment, so I probably don't want to get rid of that. Saints War armor. Yeah, bonus damage reduction and second chance. I don't think... Unless something he give, has gives me second chance, I probably don't want to swap it out. He doesn't have a belt though right now, so I could try to get him some regeneration from that. Let's see here. Any special characteristics? These things just have bonus damage reduction. Bonus damage reduction. Yeah, I'll skip on that for now. But I could go for this, uh, find leather armor. Yeah, it's just what I thought it'd be. Let's go for one troll hide. Maybe I'll sell something in, in, I'll sell something back for it. Like these spare daggers. Those are worth, those are worth garbage. Yeah, all the stuff I have is worth garbage except for this great sword that might be worth keeping around. For a character, I don't really want to throw that away yet, so I'm just going to pay for it. This will be good, because I'll give him... What? Why can't I put it on Eddar? Oh, it's the wrong slot, my bad. That was a ring slot. Okay, I was panicking for a second there. This belt has been crafted from the mossy hide of a forest troll, with intertwined vines and leaves forming a solid and resistant piece of clothing. Any damage done to the belt tends to be obscured by new growth, for the moss and small plants which grow upon the belt retain some life. Though the resulting effect is somewhat like wearing an herb garden around one's waist, 
The piece of a hide holds some of the troll's power, uh, granting the wearer the creature's ability to recover from wounds. So putting endurance recovery on our tank could be really handy to make him even harder to kill than he already is, which is frankly a little hard. Edgar is turning into a bit of a badass. Anything else I can cover up, follow up with this guy though? What's in the collapsed tower? It's collapsed. Nothing. He rolls his eyes and shrugs. A few hides on stretching racks and the tallow stench Dangler is always grumbling about. The rest of the keep's dust, just like a f the fool lady Thanyu who tried to hold it. There's a bard in the end who will tell you the whole blazing story if you want to hear it. So not much to follow up on here? Really? Alright. Yeah. Well, we got a cool item out of it at least, but I think that's all we're getting here. Just gonna have to keep checking around until I find someone who really wants to talk to me. Which might not be anyone if it's based on real life. Next step's probably Hen Hendina's Apothecary? Sure. Might as well, she's right next door. Oh, there she is. Right, at, right, right, out, right out in the open. A young woman leans against a wagon. One arm on one side of her face... One arm and one side of her face are covered in bandages with raw, rippled flesh showing underneath. A minty, tangy sweat wafts from, from her dressing. She, she smiles painfully, so she just burned herself, apparently. Just ventured into town. I'm about dry on some of the, my stocks, but you're welcome to have a look-see. How did you get burned? She turns her face to the ground. By the flame. How bad does it look? Terrible, I know it. It looks like it hurts. That's a mighty soft way of putting it. I've been keeping an eye on Drake's Nest, east of town. A Deerford Crossing. The beast stayed just long enough to lay a clutch and moved on. Thank the Sky Mother it wasn't a full-grown dragon. She looks at her ba bandaged arm and grimaces. Fresh eggs are much more useful than the ones we they get that get passed between the merchants or left in nests for weeks or more. And that clutch looked to be at its peak. Though I'd see... thought I'd see about getting an egg, but I didn't realize so many of them had already hatched, or that young worms were so territorial. What's so special about these eggs? They're one of the strongest tonics known to Keith. If you leave out Carol Golan, of course, uh, she's. If you leave, if you leave out Carol Golan, of course. Not saying anyone should take that. Uh. But dragon eggs are known for to make Kith bold, purposeful. Some even think they'll protect. They'll they'll protect from Beowax. She shrugs. All I know is everyone's pining after potions made from dragon eggs. That sounds like a really dangerous way of committing suicide on accident. But the damn roads can't reach none of my suppliers, so I'm stuck with whatever I can scrounge up in the wind. Deer crap, river reed, and the like. I could get an egg for you? She keeps her gaze steady, but you see hope kindling in her eyes and twitching at the corners of her mouth. I'm sure you're not leading me on. I sure hope you're not leading me on. I don't think I could stand getting burned again. Oh. But this time it's metaphorical. She bites her lip. If you really want to, if you really mean to go after it, I'd certainly pay you. Just remember, big as they are, dragon eggs are fragile. And there's a lot more I can do with a whole one. Hail, traveler. She adjusts one of her bandages. Anything else I could do for you? I've got handy ointments if you're braving the roads anytime soon. Actually, I'm looking for a missing noblewoman. Oh, the Lord's daughter. She was a new shade of green when I see her the other morning. Chatting with Teargirl she was, just outside his shop. She points to the crumbling tower. Oh, so they talk to each other. But I've never seen them before. You're talking about morning sickness. Was she pregnant? She sighs. I, and worked in the state about it. She was. The girl was so sick she didn't notice Teargirl's stink. I offered her some herbs to take care of the problem, though it might save her some trouble with her old man, but she wouldn't have it. Lord Heron said she was ill from travel. That weren't no road sickness, trust me. I know it when I see it. What was wrong with her? No offense, but I hardly know you. I'm not one for gossip, and I certainly don't want to cause the poor girl any trouble. Thanks for the information. God 
Let's keep you. So at the very least, we can now follow up on a. Uh, we can at least now follow up on more more leads. At least we have a reason to talk to Tyrgol now, and he can't just brush us off. Maybe. Let's take a look at her at her uh, her goods. A bunch of potions. Major endurance, a hundred endurance. Wow. Just give yourself a hundred endurance out of nowhere. But looks like it costs more than a thousand copper pieces. Is why. Oh yeah, this stuff's gonna be expensive. Don't think I want to get involved with this right now. And now, now we have a, a dragon egg quest. And hey, if I go get the dragon egg, maybe she'll be willing to talk to me. Tell me again about the dragon egg. Is there anything new? Oh wait, what's wrong with the roads? Oh wait, is this all new? It's in, it's in a nest. Is perched on a cliff on the end, east end of Deerfoot Crossing. That's out in the wilds, just as east of here. I'm sure there are others elsewhere, but the ones at Deerfoot Crossing is just the age I need. If you head out that way, be careful. The place was crawling with worms when I went out there, and I can't imagine they've gone anywhere else. What's wrong with the roads? A noise of disgust rattles from her throat. Brigands, looters, you name it. The gods may be hollowing out our babies, but it's gra but it's gro it's grown folk that's rubbing out the rest of us. All right, so we we, have, we at least have a lead, so we have a reason to go talk to the people in the broken tower again. Now that we have reason to believe they were actually communicating with the uh, woman we're looking for. Hey, buddy, I know a thing or two now. What can you tell me about Elise Herond? Asking again won't change the facts. I still know nothing about her. Huh. Hedina said you two had met. He folds his arms and the smell of tallow and animal dung wafting off of him. Did she now? And what else did she say? That Elise was pregnant? Really? That would explain a lot. Her father dra dragged her out to here to get hitched to some backwoods noble. She wanted an escape, all right, and I was happy to give it to her. We snuck across the river a few nights ago with some private time for some private time. Come to find out, we weren't exactly alone. An ogre, taller than Winfrey's tails, sprung out of the forest, and we were so lost in heat of the moment we didn't notice until it was upon us. I grabbed Elise and disappeared into the night before I could ever even pull my bridges up. Ah, oh, so they're having a fling. Okay. Oh, it grabbed Elise and disappeared into the night. <laughs> I thought I thought it said that I, he grabbed it. I'm like, then the one of the first responses was, "You abandoned her." Let's see. Yeah, don't take this the wrong way, but this shop smells like an outhouse. Am I really to believe a lord's daughter snuck into the woods with you? Tyrgo scowls. Curb that clever tongue of yours. I'm afraid there's no right way to take it, stranger. I meant no offense, I'm just trying to find her. His eyes narrow. As I was saying, the ogre vanished with her, probably took her to its lair, wherever that is. He measures with his, you with his gaze. She could still be alive. I'm in no shape to go after her, but that heron looks like he's he'd have the coppers to spare for anyone who'd found her. He scratches his cheek with fingers strain, stained yellow and red. Others around here have been seen the ogre east of town took most of Rumble's pigs the other day. If someone were to find it, there'd be a lot of grateful people in Deerford. Also, any attempt that I ever do at voices completely is inconsistent, and I completely, sometimes midway through a conversation, forget what I was doing. So, we have, looks like we're either we're either going to go ogre hunting, or we're going to tell hit the heron about the ogre and just leave it at that. Let's see... Let's look into where the ogre seems to be located. Uh, da -da -da. Hadn't it told me that Elise was talking to Tyrgol? His shop is in the broken tower near the cart. Hadn't it mentioned that Elise was pregnant? Tyrgol claims an ogre took Elise somewhere near Bale River, east of Deerford. Well, I had a hard time believing he snuck she snuck away with him. There may be some clues about her in the wilderness. So, Bale River, east of Deerford. Where's that? Do, do I have that on my map at all? Uh, I have nothing specifically called Bale River, but maybe we would see it... Yeah, I guess if we just go east on the way to Cleveland Relag, the weird 
uh, ruins. We might find some important information there. But that's gonna be it for next. That's gonna have to wait till next time because we're getting definitely into full episode territory. Thanks for watching, guys. Like always, I'll try to. Uh, sorry, I'm a little distracted today, unfortunately. But it's just been so long since the last episode. I felt like I needed to record something. Hopefully, I'll be better at reading next time. Thanks for watching, guys. Like always, I'll see you next time where we'll try to find this missing girl once and for all after all this time and maybe get to test drive our new uh, party member.